Hello friends, my name is Kate Rayworth and I'm honoured and delighted to join you in this conference on moving beyond growthism towards an economy that is in service to human rights and particularly for this session on what that can start to look like at the national level. And so I want to start with questioning what was seen as the shape of progress in the 20th century. It was the ever rising line of growth measured in terms of GDP, a single monetary metric. And crucially, no matter how rich a nation already is, I'm sitting in the UK, you're together in Geneva, in Switzerland, no matter how rich a nation already is, its politicians and economists will tell us that the solution to its problems lies in yet more growth endlessly. We've already confronted the degradation, the inequities and the exploitation that comes about from centering growth at the heart of an economy's goals. And so it's time to move beyond this outdated vision of progress. For this, I offer you instead a donut shape compass for 21st century thriving. The goal here is to leave no one in the hole in the middle of the donut. That is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life, on human rights and needs from health, education, housing, food, energy, social equity, political voice, income. These 12 social dimensions are drawn from the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly the social priorities identified in the Sustainable Development Goals, which I would argue in turn are based on almost a century of recognition of economic, social, cultural and political rights, beginning with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. So leave no one in the hole falling short on the essential rights that each person has a claim to. But as we seek to meet each person's rights and needs, and indeed their wants, there is a high risk that humanity is putting so much pressure on the life-supporting systems of Earth that we begin to push our planet out of balance. And so the ecological ceiling that we must not go beyond is made up of nine planetary boundaries. These together hold Earth in a healthy, resilient space that makes life work on this delicately balanced living planet. And I would say that the recognition and the importance of protecting these planetary boundaries is likewise underpinned by the recognition of a right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment for all. So I see that both the social and ecological boundaries of the donut are bounded in turn by a commitment to and recognition of human rights. The goal here is to live between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling in the green donut shaped space itself. And so the shape of progress is not endless growth. It is thriving in balance between these boundaries. And I would argue that this is the 21st century transformation that we collectively need to bring about. If we are to move towards an economy that is not centered on growth per se, but that it is centered on the recognition and realization of human rights. If this is the goal, we are very far from it right now, as all of the red shows us in these charts. Billions of people worldwide cannot yet meet their fundamental rights, their essential needs to health and education and housing and voice. We need to eliminate all of the red from the centre of that circle. But we must simultaneously recognise that we have already collectively overshot at least six of the nine planetary boundaries. And so we are violating the right to a clean and healthy and sustainable environment for all. Human rights calls on us to turn this story around from both sides at the same time, to come into the green space from both the social foundation and the ecological ceiling at the same time. And we must recognise that last century's economic policies and economic theories were not designed for this. They were not designed for this reality. We need new theories and policies and new designs of business to turn this story around. Let's look at this from national perspectives. Here are four very different nations. On the one end, Malawi, massive human shortfall without overshooting their share of planetary boundaries. China has a double challenge of human shortfall and already ecological overshoot. The UK, still some social shortfall, particularly there on inequality with significant ecological overshoot and the US on even higher income per person significant inequality within and very significant ecological overshoot. 
Let's take these four nations and put them as part of a scatter plot of 50 nations that illustrate the spread of countries across the world. The place where every nation sh should be aiming to be is in that top left-hand corner where there is the green donut. That is the place where a nation rises upwards to meet the needs of all of its people, but comes back within the means of the living planet. And the first thing to notice is that there is no country there. Indeed, next time you catch yourself or somebody else talking about developed countries or advanced nations, you can ask, where are you talking about? There is no country in this image that should be calling itself developed according to this understanding of what it means to thrive, because there's nothing developed about overshooting the life support systems of our planetary home. These nations also are not standing separated like spots on a scatter plot. They are profoundly interconnected from histories of colonialism through to the present and future impacts of climate change. And so, of course, the impacts upon human rights cross national boundaries. Let's also recognise that the history of pursuing GDP growth, the story throughout the 20th century, has not taken any nation into the donut. In fact, it's taken the vast majority of countries straight past it. So when nations have very low incomes per person, such as Malawi, doubling that from one and a half thousand dollars per person to three thousand dollars to six thousand dollars can have very, very significant improvements in human outcomes, in child survival, in nutrition, in household income. It can be transformative. So nations rise up. But instead of rising up into the donut, what we see is the history of pursuing growth means that the additional income of a certain level is transformed into very significant ecological overshoot due to the intensive use of energy and materials. And so countries have been shooting straight past that sweet spot that the donut offers. Can we turn this around and create a future that pursues not growth, but human rights for all? What would it mean for low-income countries to rise up, meeting the rights and needs of their people without overshooting planetary boundaries, as almost all countries before them have done. This is almost an unprecedented route. And I very much believe it will and must involve economic growth in these countries. But this growth will be in service to human thriving and achieving human rights rather than growth that is in service to itself. What would it mean for middle income nations to reorient instead of passing straight past that spot to go towards it, meeting people's needs while already coming back within planetary boundaries. And critically, the responsibility of all high-income countries to very significantly reduce their excessive draw of energy and materials in the world, coming back within planetary boundaries, while finally meeting the rights and needs of all of their people, for they certainly have the resources to do so. This too is an unprecedented journey. And these are connected by a profound need to rebalance between nations, that rebalance may include reparations for historic injustices, rebalancing through redistribution of wealth, of access to technology, through redistributing power within international institutions and many other forms. I believe, to my mind, this is part of what it means in Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to create a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms that the Universal Declaration recognises can be fully realised. So we need reorientation within every nation, but also a rebalancing between nations if we are collectively to move towards living in the donut, meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. If we focus our attention for now on the high income nations, which are drawn under the reduce arrow, let's recognise that these nations are the ones that have the greatest responsibility to face up to the lock in dependency that is created by growthism. We need to move beyond a dependency on endless growth that has been written into these national economies because we have inherited economies that need to grow, whether or not they enable people to thrive. And evidence shows that the way they are growing has not been enabling people to thrive at all. We need to create economies that enable people to thrive, whether or not they grow. This is particularly a message for today's high income nations. What will it take to make that transformation? I believe that national governments are particularly locked into endless growth because of many of the national policy frames that have growth dependency designed into them. To give a few examples, just four examples of that. 
publicly traded companies have a either cultural or legal fiduciary duty to maximize returns to their shareholders. This means that they are put under pressure by financial stakeholders, the owners of financial capital, every quarter to show that they have growing sales, growing profit and growing market share. This drives growthism within the private sector. How can we undo this form of ownership that drives endless growth and ecological and social destruction in the process? Corporate power captures political power. In order to profit from ensuring that regulation remains weak so that they can capture in financial terms the value that is taken out of living systems and social systems. How can political power and spaces be freed from this grip of corporate power? The commitment that national governments often have to growing the pie is a sure way of avoiding taking action on redistribution. Promising that a bigger pie will deliver for all means nations avoid having to face up to redistributing resources within. And so growthism is an easy way to avoid the redistributional question. How instead can nations face up to that and take it on? And lastly, a geopolitical lock-in that a growing economy helps to secure and maintain geopolitical power for a nation. Looking at this photograph from the G20, no leader wants to lose their place in this G20 family photo. But if one country declared it was going to move away from pursuing growth while the rest keep going, they will likely be booted out by emerging powerhouses. So this is a collective action lock-in problem. This is, to my mind, one of the reasons why we find it very hard to see individual nations starting to move away from growth lock-in at the national policy level. Of course, some countries have, such as Scotland, Wales, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, created the Wellbeing Governments Alliance, committing to put well-being at the heart of their national policy making. So there are attempts to move away from this. But I want to finish this presentation by moving to the local level, to city or county or district level, where many local governments have approached our work at Donut Economics Action Lab and said, what would it mean for our city to aim to live in the donut? We don't want to grow endlessly. We want to thrive here socially and ecologically. So we've turned this into a tool for cities and places. And let me share that concept with you. We unroll the donut to make space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling, and then ask this question, how can our city become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. It's a complex question, but within that question, you can hear already, this has concern both for the people of this place and people worldwide. It has a local and global aspect to recognizing rights, which we believe is crucial. So we divide it up into what we call the four lenses, local aspirations on one side and global responsibilities on the other. Let me talk you through them quickly. How can all the people of our city thrive? What would it mean to ensure the needs and rights of everybody in this place, whether it's to health and food and water and education or mobility, income, social equity and political voice? These are foundations that nobody should fall below. Meet the rights of people locally. Let's add to that a local ecological concern. How can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? If we have a right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, we need to live in cities and settlements that bring nature's generosity within them so that even our cities sequester carbon, they cool the air on a hot day, they house biodiversity, they store water, they regulate the temperature, and then our cities start to belong as part of the living world. These are the local aspirations of place, but as I said, we must recognise that the intention to live well here must not be at the cost of people or planet worldwide. So we also ask, how can our city respect the health of the whole planet? This is about coming back within that red overshoot of planetary boundaries. How can we reduce our global impact on energy use and on materials that are imported through supply chains from around the world so that we live within our share of planetary boundary use? And lastly, but crucially, how can our city respect the well-being of people worldwide? Those people who produce the products that we use here, who stitched and sewed our clothes, who picked and packed the food that we eat, who assembled the devices and phones that we use. Are people being paid decent wages with decent work through global supply chains? 
What is the impact on people's lives now of the climate breakdown that we know we contribute to here and what responsibilities does that engender? What are the policy regimes that our nation is part of and that we are therefore complicit in holding? What is the policy of welcome and a culture of welcome to migrants, to refugees when they come? These are some of the many questions that these four lenses of the donut invite us to ask. But as you can see, it focuses on the rights and needs of people here, but also recognizing our impact on people worldwide. A few places that have started to use this framework. Glasgow is one of many cities now, over 80 cities, towns, counties worldwide that have asked themselves these questions and are creating a donut shape aspiration and vision for their own locality. What does it mean to meet the needs of all people here while living well and respecting people worldwide and the health of the whole planet? In Cornwall, in the UK, they've turned it into a decision-making compass. So using it as part of local council decision-making, whether it's choices to invest in new local infrastructure or also here on the right, indicating what's happened over the past year. You can see from the traffic light colors, green is things improving ecologically, blue is things improving socially, yellow things haven't changed, red, it's getting worse. This image of Cornwall changing over time tells us so much more than if I merely told you, for example, Cornwall's GDP had gone up by 1.3% over the last year. This tells us nothing about the human outcomes. It tells us nothing about the ecological reality, the health or degradation of the place. But this compass tells us in human and ecological terms what's improving and what still needs to be turned around. I believe it's a much richer wave towards the future. And lastly, in Timpu in Bhutan, the government of Bhutan, very well known for their work on gross national happiness, said we see in the donut something closest to gross national happiness than we've seen coming out of any other kind of Western economics. And they chose to use gross national happiness in the donut as part of their conception of reinventing the future of Timpu and Paru, the capital city valley of Bhutan. So let me wrap up with three points. It is time to move beyond growthism. It is time to focus on meeting the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And this goal of getting the donut is closely aligned with being in service to a human rights economy. National governments, even in the richest countries, perhaps mostly in the richest countries, are still deeply structurally locked in to pursuing endless growth and we urgently need policy innovation and political innovation to free us from those structural dependencies so that we can evolve and move on. I'm seeing pioneers at the local level of cities and counties and towns showing that there is a clear desire to move to an economy that is in service to human thriving and ecological health so perhaps this is where we will find the policies first emerging. And I'm sure the rest of this panel will be sharing many ideas for local and national policies that can start taking us towards this human rights based economy. Thank you so much for letting me join.